Well, this one's for Robin. Uh, that was fun to say. <laughs> it's a chilly night, and I'm in a chilly room, and I'm having some hot tea. Poster of Mr. one of, one of Mr. Producer's uh, wins. Anyway, and a cup dedicated to the to the success. Oops, there you go. All right. Uh, Robin's asking, and as you've seen the title, uh, we were talking about portraits tonight and setting up portraits. So Robin says, I do wonder about your thought process and how you go about setting up your clients for portraits. How do you know which backgrounds and lighting positions are the most pleasing for each model? I would love a video on how you go about making these decisions. Do you consult with the model and what they wear? And then do you then try to find the best backdrop? I'm almost paralyzed with getting started on live portraits because I'm afraid that I won't portray them in the most beautiful and flattering way. I'm also fearful of uh, taking too much of the client's time by finding the best lighting positions and backdrops, that it will take me too long and therefore cut significantly, significantly into painting time. Any suggestions uh, would be appreciated. Robin, thank you for that, uh, that uh, query there. Um, that last part um, <clears throat> about cutting significantly into painting time, I, I laugh sometimes about the number of sittings people could get. I mean, the famous uh, 90 sittings a sergeant had with Madame X. And, uh, and, and I, I've read, I just can't remember where, the, uh, that Aang asked for a couple hundred sittings. I mean, you had to sign a contract for them. And he was able with his studies of hands and all the rest to fill a room with his, uh, you know, at the Morgan Library with, with all these preliminary works that he did, some significant numbers of which would have been at the expense of the model. Now, lots of them wouldn't be. You wouldn't be studying drapery and that sort of thing um, that would waste the model's time, and you could just simply use other resources. Sometimes, for example, you have a scarf, you can put a mannequin on that. But... Um, <clears throat> But let me, this is a fun question for me. I enjoy every aspect of painting and because of what it takes you through, you know, sort of the analysis of how to do, you know, I just keep talking about best practices, but but, but how to do each portion of this thing, uh, and as, as it were, sort of scientifically, right? The way you really manage uh, not to run into problems is to know your stuff and be prepared when the model comes in, when the, when the, when the sitter comes in. And I'm gonna, t today I'm gonna talk about um, some of those things uh, that you need to think about when you're setting up a model, because you're not wrong when you say in the most beautiful and flattering way. <clears throat> you want a beautiful color scheme to start with, and you want your portrait uh, sitter to look good, coloristically, right? And uh, so often the uh, storytelling side takes over, and you get that pose right, but you don't have beautiful color. And... Um, I'll just walk you through, Sergeant, and some of the other guys. Everybody, uh, eventually everybody gets this. But there are still some people, and I'll show you those different people, uh, who are, uh, yeah, they ignore it, I guess would be the right way of saying it. This is the color portion. So let me start, start from uh, scratch with this question. Um, um I would point you to um, the uh, something some someone a book someone came out with a bunch of years ago. I mean, about, I think back in the eighties, maybe it was called "Color Me Beautiful," and I recommend you get a copy of it and get into the ideas associated with that. But in that book, they basically say you can wear red. I don't care who you are, but you have to find the right red. And of course, the presumption is for your skin color. And of course, hair and skin are often interesting. You know, how do you manage to get one when you have, say, you have really red hair, uh, orange, you know, the orange version of red hair, and you have, um, and you have very pale, cool skin. That's you know, you're going to have to find the right kind of color to. And the word is set off, to set off the skin to make it look good. You know, this whole conversation about um, colors setting each other off is huge. And you know, if you're an impressionist, in any case. You're always trying to find colors that sing. And I'm talking about that sing in the package that are all talking to each other and uh, make, a, make a beautiful color scheme. So these are, these are really excellent questions. Do you consult with the model on what they wear? Yeah, 
you, you actually ask the model to bring a variety of things. And uh, often a model will come in with a whole lot of stuff that is bad for their skin color. And, uh, and uh, sometimes you will say, come back and you have, you'll give them a clear idea of what you're asking for. They'll say, oh, I had that, but, you know, but I don't, don't like it. I prefer this kind of red, you know, and it's just wrong for them. So um, the education that uh, I've given some sitters has changed the way they dress. Doesn't mean they can't wear red, but the right red, right? And um, you'll see what I mean soon. But with what they wear, so I try to get them to wear things that set off, that they're beautiful with their skin. And that's where the Color Me Beautiful book might be of use to you. Um, the, uh, and I'm only saying, by the way, this isn't, I was taught this and Color Me Beautiful came up later, like most stuff in my experience. But the basic principle of, of setting off and making the sitter look good, I don't think of it as flattering the sitter. Just make the sitter look healthy. Make, make, the sitter, make the sitter not look like she's about to f die. You know? <laughs> My dad used to wear blue. I hate to, Dad, forgive me for having to talk about you, but uh, he's long past, but he, but he used to wear blue and it would make his skin look really sallow. And I don't know that he ever had a liver problem of any kind, but it looked like it with those blue <laughs> suit jackets he was wearing back in the 50s, 60s. And my mom seemed not to pick up on it. Um, she's continued to dress him in a... And then you try to find the best backdrop? Of course you do, yeah. And the best, and the best backdrop has everything to do with uh, the skin color and setting off the skin color. Some part of it is probably going to be touching the skin. And I'll show you again on, in pictures. I'll show you how some of that works. But yeah, you're trying to you're trying to find a background that is good for your sitter. Now, there's a bunch of things. You have values in backgrounds. So you talk about if you have a person who's very very pale skinned and very black hair. What do you do for the background? You probably find something halfway in between those in value in the background, and, and because you'll be able to get a great pattern out of the hair, and you'll be able to to not make in the face won't look too brilliant. You know, they might not look too to white it out. Um, so you're, but you, you, you're looking for a color scheme, you're looking for a value scheme. Now, the key to all this stuff, the model's gonna bring in the clothes they have, right? And you're not gonna dress them in your clothes. I've had models go out on their own and, and buy other clothes once they realize what, what they really needed. And I've had models come to me and, uh, and deciding what they wanted to do, and we just consulted, and I suggested what kind of, for example, they wanted to wear whites and rather dressy to suggest a prom or something. And I just told them what kind of whites. It was very easy to sit them down and show them whether it was going to be a warm white, a cool white, or like sort of a linen versus a blue. Remember, whites come in all kinds of colors. They come through red, yellow, blue, everything. And you're looking, and that'll show up in the images I show you in a second. So I to consult with them on every kind of level, uh, and um, and then it's up to me to use those things that they're wearing that obviously are really good for their skin, and set the body off in other ways. And then find the appropriate backdrop uh, to be to participate in the in the proposed color scheme. We're going to see that it's not infrequent for the background to be a green version, a green color. If you're thinking of Holbein, Holbein's in my background there. I wonder if you can see that. Uh, Holbein's pick, <laughs> canvases are almost every single one of them is green, and it, it and it's uh, it's actually like it's almost like a model of. <laughs> what a portrait might want to do if he means to set off the red. What happens with the, um, the reason for green is that your body, your colors, your flesh is full of, of, of greens and yellows as well as reds. And when you're trying to make somebody look healthy, it's the red that we lean toward. We're inclined to see the health in peachy cheeks and all the rest of that stuff. So what you're, but what'll happen, and I'm gonna show you this as well, when you put a red background on somebody, uh, you'll tend, What'll happen is that the red will be eaten out of the face and, you'll, and what'll be left over is gonna be sallow. It's gonna be either yellow or tending toward green and blue. The more you put a green and blue background in, the less you see the green and blue of the face and you'll just see how it works. You have to just do this by trial and error. And by the way, if you're worried about a particular sitter, just you have hired models and figure this out with hired models. What you want to have in your, in your studio is a bunch of backgrounds that are possible though. Just have them available to yourself. Have a right, a, way, a range of values, and a range of of um, colors through those values. Uh, that's just a thing you should have in your studio, if you're planning to do portraits. Have and be able and be able to switch them out. 
But the second thing you need is you want to have a, a range of, of what I think it's called toll or tool or whatever. It's the, um, it's this um, uh, webby, very, very, very thin webby sort of uh, uh, material, you know, very um, uh, transparent. And it comes in all kinds of colors. And so if you have a, a green that's just not quite warm enough, you can lay an orange in front of it, right on top of it. And, and you'll, it'll, it's so thin that it'll, it'll basically disappear. It'll just give you, it'll just adjust your color for you a little bit. And I really high, re highly recommend that you also have a pile of those kinds of colors. All nice range of them. Dark slides, everything in between. Uh, just do it, you'll be able to move your colors. So, see, the idea is to be able to see that the model looks good and not to change things in the painting to hopefully make the model look good. You're really trying to teach yourself how to create a, a good color scheme, how to, how to take a note, and the skin is relatively, in one sense, neutral, and actually make it the feature color of a painting. And to do that, you need to do a, be able to do a lot of trial and error until you see with your own eyes that it's actually happening in front of you. So, um, but it's a trial and error. Remember, best backdrop is a trial and error, but you have to have in mind that you're trying to make the sitter look healthy. Um, but yeah, and then the, the other question you're, gonna, you're asking is about best lighting positions. So I've had sitters that weren't that good looking and uh, or might have a defect of some sort, like a, an unusual nose or something like that, that, that wouldn't flatter them. And, uh, and there's some people who actually would rather you know, give you a profile, they have an interesting nose. And you wouldn't do that to a sitter. You might do that just if you're like a Leonardo, you might be trying just to, to paint something unusual. You know, we can do that, but that's not what I call a portrait. That's not, you're always trying to make people, uh, you're trying to find the best in people's features. What are their most attractive aspects? And so the turning of the head is a big thing. And then the way you light it is the other one. And so just with that same thing in mind, it's all trial and error. There's, it's all, as you say it right, uh, finding the best lighting positions and backdrops, finding them, but it's all trial and error. Now, when you've been, been, had a little bit of experience, um, you'll go through each of these sort of separately. For example, you will realize that a person has a defective thing and you find their best side. And by the way, you don't have to say they have a defective thing. You just simply say, I want their best side. I, really, I want to have fun painting it, so I want to like what I see. So if you see something that actually disturbs you in some way, or just simply, frankly, you just simply have found something that's really magical, then, then the first thing is to try to get that happening, and the second thing is to improve on it with the light as, you know, in whatever way you can. Um, I, it is true that light that comes down from above, 30-degree angle, that's sort of thing Reynolds talks about it, will give you better underplanes and better sense of form and that sort of thing. Side light is possibly the least attractive. You're going to have to go through those. You could do them with a cast. By the way, just a cast. You can just light a cast and just turn, 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 turn. You can't do the coloring that way. But, but um, you can do the, um, but you can do the lighting and the position so you can turn a cast, turn a cast, turn a cast. Or you can, and by the way, don't just turn the cast because if the light's coming from X position and you can't move it like most windows, then you have to move yourself around to the side until you have, you know, you have a three-quarter light, you have front light, you have three-quarter light front, and you have a side light or where you're standing where it's getting close to being half dark. These are all places where you're going to look and analyze, but each one of these has their own beauties. And the thing to remember with that thing, you're creating patterns and stuff in the face, you're trying to set off the model, but you're also trying to make an interesting picture to look at. So intrigue yourself, intrigue, you know, you want, you, when the model gets all done, if you've done your work and the model looks good, uh, and it also then has a really interesting patternistic world, you know, pattern, shadows, shapes, um, sp light spots, and whatever the distribution is and all that stuff, uh, you're going to have a picture that'll last and won't wind up in the attic, which is always what we're aiming for, right? To <laughs> To, to not be up in the attic, down in the cellar with the, with the uh, moisture. Um, yeah, so yes, you, you consult the model, you find, you try to find the best rack, and I'll look at these pictures and walk with you through this again. Um, again, just the, the first question you ask, how do you know which backgrounds and lighting positions are the most pleasing for each model? <laughs> it's trial and error. That's all you can do. Even the 
By the way, you got to set models. You want to set models in ways that they aren't going to have injured necks by the time you're done. And they are going to have to sit for a couple hours. I was looking at a sergeant. They said he didn't have 12. It was just a head. He didn't 12 hours, but it was six sittings of two hours each for the model. That's a lot of work for a model. And for a sitter, the last thing you want to do is make them say, oh, it was so painful sitting for so-and-so. So don't give them poses where you're craning the neck around dramatically. And you, you don't do that. Well, by the way, if you haven't sat for a portrait, the first thing you should do before making other people sit is sit for one. Sit, sit for somebody and sit for hours and hours. Take two, two and a half hour, maybe even three hour sitting, sittings with somebody who knows how to hold you in place and find out what that feels like. And I can speak as someone who's done it. So, you know what I mean? Uh, so please consider your sitter and, and you'll survive. You'll, your career will survive. By the way, all this stuff about considering your sitter, your sitter actually should be involved right from scratch in the, all your decisions. There should be a consult. This is a whole thing as a consult until finally you say, I get it. Uh, I know what you want. I see your color. I see what you must be, your color scheme and all that sort of stuff. I've, you've given me all the information. I need about what you want. I've got your clothes. These are all the things we're agreeing that go well in this picture. And now I'm going to do a study for you. And I will do a, a little four by six study in an hour or so, maybe a little longer, but but just with the idea of letting them see, you know, now look, look, this is what you're going to get. What do you think? And uh, sometimes I'll actually have a mirror and actually show them themselves, a big mirror, and have, show them themselves sitting. I've had sometimes had models watch me paint them. It's not the best thing to do. It makes you too, it makes you, it, it, it complexifies your, your, um, uh, what, what do you call it, your um, thinking so much. The, you know, you, you're thinking about too many things. You wind up having, you know, being only half there for the portrait. Hmm. All right, I think that's it. So let's just walk through them, and I'll talk about. I think I first probably just talk about uh, about color. And um, so let's move on to the first slide. Now, this is where I, I'm starting on a negative side. I didn't mean to do it, but the first when I first arrived in Boston, this Della Roche had a lot of fondness for Della Roche, and still do, by the way. But here's Della Roche setting up a sitter exactly the way you wouldn't want to, <laughs> from the point of view of having the face. I just when I saw this thing, I was so off put. I saw it in person in Boston, the MFA. I was so off put by the color of the guy's head. I couldn't deal with it. I mean, I just like, whoa, that is so bad. And I know nothing about color schemes and beauty in that way. I, you know, but this picture taken as a whole isn't even that nice as a color scheme, right? It's not magical, that's for sure, coloristically. And Della Roach sometimes is pretty magical. He's not as good as others, Ang and others, but uh, with color. But, but here he does it again. He's put a red background behind. By the way, this, this richness of this thing, this is, I don't know if that's supposed to be gold leaf and this guy is some important person in the church or something like that. But, is, you know, it, <laughs> you're making the guy look so bad. I mean, he's powering up the lights to set him off at least and he's got a nice black halo around him. But look at that, your richest colors are all floating around all around his head and he's this dead spot in the middle. Those are the kinds of things I really do try to avoid. And you'll see when I show you Sergeant later how everybody does. Uh, but this is another one, Napoleon, and he did a number of them at Napoleon, one of the Napoleons. And, um, but this is um, the red background here that shows forth the coldness of his skin. Now, you could say that he was trying to show off uh, what Napoleon might have looked like when he was, you know, in Russia or, or wherever the brutal climate he was in was. So, but on the contrary... One of the early portraits I saw of um, Velasquez was this head in person, was this head here uh, of a cardinal. And, you know, see this picture also has reds, bright reds, but you can see how healthy the skin looks. And that has lots to do with the fact of this being a greenish kind of color, which is very typical. As I said, if you're looking at Holbein, they're all just greens. You know what I mean? Like it's a green out of some sort of a, of a, uh, a tempera tube or something like that, if there's such a thing. But uh, he has separated the red of the face from, you know, by all this stuff, by these neutrals from this red here. All he has up here is a black line, but the real reds down here are separated too. But whatever is happening, you can see that the model looks healthy versus this one where the model looks a little on the sick side, right? 
And that was that would be what my dad might have looked like with his blue clothes on and all these cool notes, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now I'm going to talk about the Degas later. Um, and I think I, I, I think I'll keep it out of this for the moment. Maybe I won't even come back to it. But because it, it just goes off the point just a little bit. Now, I hope you can see that these two pictures, now this one you've seen before, it's a, but I want you to just look at the thing, the whole picture. And you can see that what the attempt is in both cases is to feature this color here. So everything else around it, you can see that this is tribute. Everything here is the greenishness, you see, and the coolness is tribute to the nude figure. That's what it's doing. Now, this is a darker one. And it moves off toward the blue to greens rather than the yellow version. And I, this is a little off too, by the way. They're always off, I think. Uh, but you can see that this picture taken as a whole, you can see the body of the figure is, as it were, the red-yellow side. Now, you can have accents of orange and other kinds of colors around, but the head is beautifully featured. That's it. it looks healthy. It doesn't look lost in both cases here, right? So it's the kind of stuff you can do. You guys can think this through some more, but the color scheme, the whole, the whole of this thing, you can see it's based on featuring this, right? In both cases, it's based on featuring the model. And uh, here's a blue girl that I copied as a, as a uh, young student. Um, and you can see it's the same thing, that same greenish background. Now, he doesn't always do that. Nobody always does one thing or another. And there are other reasons that have to do with aesthetics as well. So don't, don't take it that I'm giving you this formula or that one must do this and anybody who doesn't do it is a bad, it's a baddie or something. Uh, you've, seen the, you've seen the sunny lit skin in the, by, by DeCamp before. Now, if you can just stay back a bit and look at these things from a bit of a distance, even blow your eyes, you'll see how healthy the skin does look and how beautifully that kind of color has been featured. And if you're trying to do a portrait, if you're trying to, if you're trying to feature a, 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 an individual and say, look at that beautiful thing, then that would be the case that you would want this coloristically, that that might be exactly what you're looking for. So you can see how everything in here is full of greens. And her face is full of greens too, but the reds win because the greens out here and the greens everywhere in this picture are subduing them. In other words, so if this world's all greens, this is the red by having some extra red in it. You know, there's the ear, lips, whatever. This was fun to copy. This, I don't, in my version right now, this is not coming out very rich. I hope yours is coming out better in both these cases. Yeah, and that's just the setting off of the skin. A very simple idea. <clears throat> uh, you can talk about the lighting, um, you know, the, the idea of, of um, what the form is doing. So this is a side, an upper, this is what I was saying, you know, maybe something of a, um, maybe you can judge by this, but it's something of a, like a 45 degree light, it looks like. Uh, you can base it on other things. You, can, you might be able to analyze it more closely than I have yet. But something like a sort of a standard thing, maybe somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees. And, um, but you can see how beautifully it features the profile, the, uh, the, um, um, the middle of the face, beautifully features the middle of the face because that's that grand joint there. Uh, but that's, so that's a turn of head. He's, she's not front on. This one's virtually a profile. What gives it hope is that it's, it's underplaying, looking up at it is fascinating. But these are things you're just going to do and, and look at these things and say, uh, that's it. That really sums up what I see in this person. That's the most beautiful turn of the head or whatever I've seen. And then just make sure the whole thing that works together in that unified way. Now here's Sargent. And this is, if you can see these, and I really hope you can, the hardest part of these, things, these videos is to get the colors to make sense. But, um, but this is a really nice example. Very pale, everything. But it's very obviously that this is the cold, that is to say, the greens, the yellows, all that was sitting out here. Now, even while there are yellows in here, and all those colors are in here, this is, as it were, the red of this picture. And it's picking up this red and others down and around, right? But that red group, but this is the healthiness of the human. You see how healthy it looks in both cases? And in every case, it seems to me, almost every case, Sargent really works at featuring the skin in a healthy way, making him look good. Um, again, if you're using any kind of light, you're going to get shadows on the face. And just don't, don't get upset with that. Sometimes the fun part is to reduce the shadow to a little blip on one cheek. Sometimes just narrowing this line down through the middle. But 
That's all going to be stuff you're going to do by trial and error. Uh, remember, every one of these is in the class of a color scheme, um, the dis distribution of these blues that are floating around through here, maybe even in the eyes, which I can't tell you I can see with this, but uh, the, or the distribution of everything in here, whatever to whatever degree there's a purple nest, you expect it to show up again. This isn't the kind of stuff you invent. This is the kind of stuff you set up. If you're a, a good painter, if you're a skilled um, uh, portrait painter, you don't, you're not looking to be clever or whatever. And, and usually when you start as a painter, you're not clever at all. You don't know enough to, use, to, to, just, to just delve into your great trove, you know, of brilliance and experiences and all that. You don't have it, so... Set it up until it really looks good. And then follow Gamble's commentary that if it looks, it's, your painting is only going to look as good as it looks sitting in front of you. And uh, that's, the, that's your best approach to this, to say that. There's Sergeant, there's Titian on the left. Again, you can see that this is a green to blue general picture, yellow as other things. And the healthiness of the skin is, is very real. He's focusing on, on featuring that in some way that's very attractive. Sargent's totally doing it, right? These warmer greens here, the cooler ones in this one. By the way, I can't guarantee these colors are this way, but this is definitely a question of featuring that he understood and featuring by color, by featuring the reds, letting the reds lead, letting the healthiness lead. Now this is yellow looking. I can't tell you. I've, the pictures I've seen of this, uh, and I haven't seen this in person. This looks, at least I can't remember seeing it in person. Sometimes this looks yellow, sometimes it looks considerably redder. But in, this, in any case, this is that featured area by red. This is the family of the reds, and the reds are showing off down here, and your eye has an inclination to do that. Pay attention to those to be, be aware of the reds, unless they take over everything, and then your eye will be aware of other things. But, and, you know, in other words, unless you have, if you have a big red background, the reds in here will hardly mean much. Uh, by the way, that idea of using a red back here, if you have more brilliant reds in the face, then the red back here probably can, I mean, can easily work. It's not at all surprising if that happens. Um, yeah, and again, I don't know why he turned this guy this much, but here he's lost. He has no light at all on that cheek. And Sargent has barely any. He has the light just coming, hitting the eye. So, uh, but very striking uh, lighting in terms of expression of something like strength in the case of Sargent. Uh, but there's your, there's your color scheme, there's your pose. One of the things you're going to be trying to do when you pose it, you're trying to get the, the orientation of your spots to be great. You know, this, the play of these lights is being a dark picture. And, and any other systems and games you have, if you have reds, watch, them how, watch how they play in relation to each other. But, but, the, uh, but the lights, this, this thing here playing up into this whole thing is the package. That's the center of interest package. In both cases, pretty much the same way. Now, this is the book, and I'm just leaving it here for you. And I'll go back through the pictures again with, uh, to talk about another aspect of composition. But uh, it almost looks like in the photograph that she doesn't know how to do color me beautiful. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the, um, I, I can't not tell you I've read carefully all of her thought. And I know there are several other books on the subject. Uh, this is Carol Jackson. A, and by the way, Carol Jackson, if you ever run into this or somebody you know her, tell her I commend her for this. But all this is is a confirmation that there that you have to find if, if the right colors for the skin of the sitter if you really want them to look their best. And even when setting up still lives, I find students will not find the right color to correspond with the other colors they have. You know, learn to do that. It's very basic. If you learn it, in, if you learn it, the idea of wanting to feature a single color, a particular color, in uh, a still life, you'll apply it in the, um, in the portrait. So let's see uh, if there's anything else I could talk about. Um, the, the, um, the backgrounds, let's talk about that for a second, but you can see the green, the, a warm green, that's really what you might as well call brown. Browns and greens often look good with certain kinds of skin. You, you talk about people who are, are uh, pink, like a lot of uh, Europeans, uh, a lot of Americans, uh, but we go all the way over to various kinds of yellows, and then there's all the skins of different races that this move all the way through, move all the way through through golds and through, and then back into golden reds, and, like, and as the dark values get darker, and each one of them has their beauty. Find the find the beauty that sets off. Find the color that sets off the 
the healthiness of that skin and you'll be in the ballpark with these guys. Nobody wants to look unhealthy. It's not flattering. It's not flattering a person to have them look healthy. It's just showing them at their best, right? But here's a blue background on the left one. The, the right one you can see is general, so rather, as it were, a green, uh, again. And that's as it were, remember that I'm saying that. It's sort of a version of ivory, but this isn't ivory. This is the red version of something that might be said to be akin to that, right? Obviously, they're both whites, and so on. So, um, again, the green background of Booger. I wasn't making this video to show you greens as being so significant, but in, in the world of, of you know, the, the, the better, that's the better part, the, uh, the, the larger number of white-skinned people, um, that green thing in the skin isn't a healthy-looking thing. Um, and by the way, every skin color, every, 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 from what I've seen so far, every ethnicity has skin colors that are, some people are cooler, some are warmer. And um, you, that's the kind of thing she's paying attention to Carol Jackson in that book. She's simply pointing out that, or that, for example, I have a, had a, a student at one point that had really black hair and her skin was like, like stone, it was like marble. And the, it was amazing, you know, and it was to, to get that to look colored if you wanted it to, to make it look healthy, you really had to watch, mind your P's and Q's. Now, that doesn't mean that's all you want to feature with somebody. You may choose to feature the ivoriness in a way that is, I still would avoid making you look unhealthy. Watch out for that. But, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that, yeah. Now, the, what I was going to say about this Degas, this isn't a portrait, uh, by the way. This is, this is a picture with a person in it. And I think it has a name that goes with some tale. You know, maybe some Greek myth or whatever. I forgot the name of it. But what you'll see he's done here. Now you'd say, if you get way back on this, you'd say this is not, this is one of the least attractive lights in this picture. <laughs> it's a little bit on the sick side. But actually the way you get away with that is by having a system. This is actually a step away removed from this, getting, as it getting oranger, and then the orangest one is here. And so you wind up having a really interesting color scheme. And this is Degas 101, right? You wind up having a really interesting color scheme in which the skin of the human isn't featured. It's just a one of the stones and one of the one of the markers on the on the on the ride through the in this case the oranges, shall we say? So <laughs> that's that's the way that works, right? But you still, if you're taking your sitter and you painted them like this in a background like that, I have a suspicion they would be unhappy that they look so ill. <laughs> Something to consider. I don't know. Uh, let me go back to your question though and see if there's anything else I might have talked about. Uh, backgrounds in p good pictures, you know, good coloristic pictures go in every direction. Um, the richer they get, the more difficult it is to not have the human look like the dead spot. And um, so that's something you want to think about. How do you, how, what is the role that the sitter is playing? But if your sitter, if you're, trying, if you're being hired to do a portrait, consult with your sitter as you ask that. So I do wonder about your thought process and how you go about setting up your clients for portraits. How do you know what backgrounds and lighting positions are the most pleasing for each model? Trial and error, you find out by trial and error. I would love a video, here, here you are, here you are, Robin, enjoy. Um, do you consult with the model on what they wear? Yes, and the more you do it before they ever arrive, the better. You're looking for a variety of values, red, yellow, blue, and all those things, and tell them to find the ones that they think make their skin look. Tell them that what you're trying to do. And then do uh, you then try to find the best backdrop, exactly right, and the idea is, again, to set off the skin plus create a color scheme. Um, I typically go through finding the uh, clothing, clothing they're going to wear first. If we can't solve that one, we've got a significant problem. I'd love to talk about this in more depth. Sometimes you have sitters who come in with these spots, wonderful spots, and there are ways to use everything. So don't ever think you have to dumb this thing down. I'm talking about like color spots, like, like big uh, chunks of like a floral dress or something like that. There are ways to do that, but it, it, it will give you, uh, it'll have to give you, it'll definitely give you pause. As you sit back and think, I like that word, give you pause. You need to pause. You need to, you need to meditate on these things. And then you do, need to do trial and error, which is part of the meditation process. You need to try, what, 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 like this, what, have I tried that? And just watch and watch and watch and see where, see, see where the beauty, st when the beauty starts rising. And you'll know where you are. But first the clothes and then the backdrop, yes. And then, uh, and then of course, set them up so that they look good uh, 
uh, so, so you've got the best shapes that they have. Um, so you're really playing up their features beautifully. And I am talking about pictorially, how features work pictorially. Not, if they have cute eyes or something like that, it's very nice. Uh, but watch out that you're thinking about things as, f you know, in all the painterly ways, you know. What is the form doing? What is the color, you know, and what, you know, so all these things matter, all of them taken together. So, um, uh, but everything, just look and look and look until there's no decision to be made. I love that mentality. Just, just don't stop looking. Just don't stop looking. Look and look and look and pretty soon you just know. And uh, that does require you. And by the way, you don't make decisions. You, you can say when you're, when I'm looking at the model, I will simply say, let's put that one aside. We might use that one. And I'll put the other one on the other pile. And pretty soon we'll have a pile of ones we might return to and go, walk through them again. You'll know pretty well which ones are actually right away exciting to you. That is, they're doing something really, really beautiful with the model. And uh, watch out that you don't get involved in the, in, the, in the liking a color because you want to do a red picture this time or something. Like, don't do that to your sitter. <laughs> don't ever do that to somebody who's paying. You're, custom, you're creating a custom product. Your job is to do what they want. Right? So, yeah, be thoughtful about that kind of stuff. Uh, something you've always wanted to do. Well, that'll come for you. It'll come to you uh, when, uh, when it's the right thing. So, uh, but that's, that's, that's a typical thing that I do. But when the sitter gets there, I, I like to have pi enough piles of, of, of background material, a good variety. I go through the browns. You, after a while, you get to know which, kind, which sort of range almost everybody lives in. You can be surprised. So keep that pile somewhere not too far away and make it so it's organized enough for you to find things easily. Color, color coded or whatever else, you know, make the pile go from, you know, through the, through the red, yellow, blues or whatever. Um, you know, I tell students when you're trying to find the right color for this sort of orange that you have that you're going to paint, the, the right, say, green, I say, try a green, try a green that's got, uh, heads toward the blues, try greens that head toward the, the reds. You know, keep, mo keep moving toward the oranges, keep moving those greens uh, until you see the one, right? By the time you get doing this, done doing this trial and error, you're going to have a really good uh, what I would call a color sense. You're going to have a. You're going to have color theory, and I am talking about beauty-based color theory, not the color theory out of a book, but beauty-based color. You're going to. You're going to have. I, you're, you're going to, your brain's going to start saying, "Wow, I wonder why that worked. What, what was that I just saw?" And the more times you do it and have those kinds of successes, the more your brain is actually going to evolve a, a, a deep understanding. Do you see what I mean? A, and a sense of things. This is going to be very practical and useful for you, going forward. But you see that I'm not recommending a particular color or any of those sorts of things. And I'm not saying, do color me beautiful. I'm really not saying that. I'm saying, learn a simple principle. Colors, there are colors that set off this person's skin. And there are colors that make her look really bad. Or him. So, but your instincts, Robin, they look really excellent. So just, I think you just need to get a model and just start. And by the way, lots of people will sit for you. A neighbor will sit for you who's bored, you know. An older person or whatever. It's all the same thing. And just go through it a bunch of times, right? And you don't, you know, you can do, if, if it comes to that, you can do a study of them and give it to them. Uh, you know, just, just don't, you don't have to think of it as a portrait exercise. Or you can just give them tea, you know, at the end of the day. But you can find a way, you can find a way to, um, to explore this without spending a ton of money and without taking risks with a client. So, you know, I would always recommend, of course, you've done your homework before you ever bring a client in the room. <laughs> so you, you know your stuff. You, you will look professional. Go and look at, uh, if you haven't already seen it, I've talked about how to pose heads. Make sure that, I have, maybe I haven't talked about it with you. Maybe when I have to do it at a different time. But when you do sit somebody, you have to learn their pose. That Especially I'm talking about the tilt and all that stuff of the head. You see how a head can go up or down this way? And if they do it, the ear will go higher or lower in relation to the nose. So you have to be good at memorizing these things. The head's turned this way. Where exactly is the center point? Is it two thirds, one third? What? You've got to be. You have to have learned these things. And then there's this kind of tilt also. What is the angle between all these eyes and ears, and how does it relate to vertical? But those are three things you want to be able to take when you're, you know, when you're looking at the, at the pose. You want to have memorized those things. You can bring a person back into it. But I don't go after poses until I've gotten the color right. It's just like in the painting part. I get the color right, get the color scheme right. And then in a secondary way, you can, and by the way, 
you have a, a studio, so set the model where you're probably going to wind up painting, and have you'll have enough space for yourself to decide whether to paint more toward the front or more toward the side. Uh, if you set them well over toward one side of the light, and uh, but um, um, don't go after you're not going to be worrying about that kind of stuff until you've set the color scheme, both the background. And by the way, don't underestimate the background, like having it moving from, like if you cast a shadow, it'll be darker on one side and lighter on the other. One of the things you've got to understand that I'm trying to do when I set up a portrait is I'm, I'm trying to get play. Degas says it's all silhouette, so I'm looking for some silhouette play. Yeah, I want a darks on lights, darks on middle tones. I want lights on middle tones, lights on dark. I want, a, I want shapiness, so I want some fun in that direction. And of course, I want good form. I want, I want the light... If it's too brilliant and too close, you have the model too close to the window, the form's just going to be flattened out. So you have to have your model far enough away. There's a bunch of stuff like that. These are generic things that you want to learn to do. And so I'm hoping that gives you a little bit of a, of a road in, uh, Robin, and anybody else trying to do it. Um, it's a good subject. So if anybody else has, you know, wants to delve into it further, let me know. We can do a part two to this thing. In the meantime, Robin, here's to you. Thank you all for your for your uh, uh, past donations, for your for your comments. This one, and uh, for all your um, likes, subscribing, sharing, all that stuff. Very much appreciated. Well, I look forward to seeing you in the next one.